Hello, everyone. My name is Anil Madhavapedi from the University of Cambridge, uh, from a group known as the Camel Labs. And I'm here to present the state of the Camel platform as of 2020, and also to talk about some of our development plans moving forward into 2021. As always, this talk has uh, been the aggregation of the efforts of many people from the Camel community. And so I'm just presenting this on behalf of my colleagues and, and, and maintainers from the various projects that I'm going to be talking about. So to recap, what is the OCaml platform? Very simply put, the OCaml platform makes users productive with the OCaml language. And in an ideal world, this platform would be invisible. You would simply be able to uh, open an editor, write some OCaml code, and be in the zone for solving the problem that you're trying to solve with the OCaml language. In reality, of course, we have to integrate OCaml with many, many other systems. We have to uh, deal with building things. We have to uh, document the things that we, 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 uh, we construct, and we also have to publish this uh, to the outside world. And so the OCaml platform is all of the scaffolding and the tooling around the OCaml compiler in order to make it usable for day-to-day -day work, and especially on large-scale code bases and the kind of open source uh, environments that we're used to dealing with in this modern world of development. And so what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is something we've been aiming for and developing on for quite a long time, which is how do we have this seamless IDE experience with OCaml? After that, I'm going to talk about the next steps for the OCaml platform and how we're going to tie together a lot of the advances we've made over the last few years into something concrete on the OCaml website. And then finally, talk about plans uh, for this year and for 2021 uh, based on um, what all of the projects and the various maintainers have uh, decided to work on. So integrated development environments. Most of the time as a programmer is spent staring at an IDE. This is a window with uh, source code in it, but also the various hooks and keystrokes you need to build your code, to look up uh, API documentation, uh, to format your code, and finally to run your code and run tests and, and uh, various other things that you do as part of the day-to-day -day development of OCaml code. Traditionally, OCaml as a statically typed language uh, has really benefited from editor integration. So because you're defining this rich type information and a lot of uh, extra metadata around the intentions of your program, as a programmer, you benefit from seeing this, uh, this type information and interactively using that to develop the rest of your code. OCaml has always had good support for the Unix style editors, uh, Emacs and my personal preference, Vim. And within these, uh, we've built up some really incredible capabilities for not only looking at what your code is doing, but also to helping you refactor code, to reformat code, and generally to make it as friction-free as possible to, um, to develop OCaml code. Unfortunately, it kind of stopped there. So developing editor support for a new language has traditionally been a very complicated thing because you have to get familiar with a new editor and a number of tools. And also you have to build a very low latency system, one that is matched to the speed of your typing and can in real time run the entire compiler tool chain, all of the tools running in harmony and reflect things in real time at the speed of you typing. And if you have a high latency, editor, you notice that immediately because it distracts you rather than helping you because the code that you're working on is, is, uh, is suddenly further away. So when we look at how this used to work, we have editors such as Emacs, such as Vim or, or, or Atom, and they all had their own IDE specific plugins that were, that were built. And all of these, these, uh, these plugins, for, such as written in Elist for Emacs or uh, VimScript or, 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 or Python for Vim or JavaScript for Atom, um, all had to figure out and know about the full OCaml ecosystem. So how to use Merlin for code generation and uh, code inference, how to use a Camel format to reformat your code, how to use ODoc or CamelDoc to uh, get you all the type annotations. And as you might guess, this is just a big complex endeavor. And while the big Unix editors were well supported, the explosion of editors in the last five years from Visual Studio Code to uh, Sublime Text to Atom, uh, and the many, many web editors out there have not been well supported in OCaml. Luckily, this has not been a problem that is OCaml's alone. Every other language ecosystem has this as well. And so a consortium of uh, vendors led by Microsoft developed the language server protocol. Uh, 
And what the language protocol server does is to abstract away from the details of the tools in the language and the editor. So this means that every editor can have an LSP client, which is used to contact an LSP server, which in turn detects what language you're using and, can, and understands how to talk to all of the different backend tools. And the LSP protocol is designed for editors. So it's quite low latency, uh, it supports uh, multiple uh, simultaneous requests and is generally tuned to the type of workflows that you have when you're in an IDE environment. So the idea behind the LSP protocol is that if you do one implementation of, of, a, of a backend language, you should suddenly be able to use all of the LSP client aware editors out there. And that is what we've done in OCaml this year. So from scratch, we've developed a LSP implementation and a server which integrates all of the OCaml tools behind the scenes into one single binary so that you will just have the ability to see type annotations, to do auto completions, uh, to do formatting and documentation inspection through a single server. So this is obviously not sprung out of nowhere. It's built on existing tools in the OCaml platform ecosystem. It uses Merlin for its, uh, its uh, type annotations. It uses ODOC for its uh, documentation parsing. It uses the markdown library in OCaml called OMD in order to render this uh, onto the screen. But the idea is that it puts it all together and it exposes a consistent LSP front end for you. And it's also built in pure OCaml. So it uses our ecosystem and it's much, much more maintainable against the rest of the compiler. So LSP is a very important advance when it comes to IDE support for new users in particular, because it provides a sustainable basis for expanding our IDE support. Where, whereas previously we had to convince newcomers to use uh, uh, Vim or, or heaven forbid Emacs, now we can, we can let them use their editor of choice. And given that most modern editors are getting LSP support, we can have a reasonable expectation that they will not have to learn two things at the same time. They will just have to learn OCaml and not also learn how to navigate a new editor. And in order to make all of this really fit together, one of the most popular editors in the last uh, few years has been Microsoft Visual Studio Code. And what Microsoft Visual Studio Code represents is a popular, extensible through plugins and a cross-platform editor. It works on Linux, on Mac OS and Windows, and has built up a tremendous community uh, of people building extensions to support their languages using it. And VS Code was one of the first editors to support the language server protocol. Uh, and so all you have to do now with Visual Studio Code is to install from the extension screen, the OCaml platform extension, and off you go to the races. It supports all of the features that newcomers will expect from a modern IDE. Let me show you some of the features that uh, you can get inside the new Visual Studio Code plugin. The simplest one is the ability to hover when you look over types. So this is often required uh, configuration editors, but now as you can see, as you look over code, all you have to do is hover over types, over values, um, over modules in this case, um, and you will see the types as inferred by OCaml. Notice also that the types include the documentation strings that are included in the OCaml doc with them as well. And then when you're writing code, you can also autocomplete uh, and so this is when you're in line and uh, in any OCaml context, any module or function you write will not only include the function, it will also include uh, the type of the function as well. And all of the different uh, representations of uh, modules, of, of, of types and values have different icons and are separated in the autocomplete. And then we get into some pretty cool new features. So you have things such as the ability to destruct pattern matches, and when you write a camel code, we describe types, and then you often have to run functions over those types. In this case, let me look at uh, a very simple type declaration. We will declare type bar of int or type foo of building. Now, the next thing we'll have to do when we define this type is to write some function that operates over that type. So in this case, I'm going to define a two string function. And instead of now having to manually enumerate all of those types, I can simply click and destruct inside my editor and it will replace that placeholder with all of the types that I defined. And in this case, I can then go through and remove the placeholders and re replace them with useful functions using the previous features such as autocompletion and um, uh, type inference that were shown uh, from the other uh, features of the editor. 
And so this really speeds up editing because as you're dealing with large amounts of code and large numbers of types, this provides you with a way to really easily generate boilerplate and also still benefit from all the various um, uh, editor helpers. And when it comes to dealing with large scale code, the VS Code plugin also has full project sandboxing. So this means that whenever you open a project, it will ask you for exactly what OPAM uh, environment that you want to work in. So if I'm uh, in there, you can just type in a camel in the Visual Studio Code environment, and you can select a sandbox for this plugin, and it will tell you exactly which switch to use, either via local switch or a global open switch, depending on your development experiences. And you can also use the easy package manager if you prefer a different lock file driven approach as well. So what we've shown you here is a whirlwind tour over a new IDA experience that we think will be really, really helpful for new newcomers who are just not familiar with the intricacies of camel tooling and just want a nice, simple front end to get started with a camel that is as familiar as possible as other languages they have developed. You can try it right away by just Googling for the OCaml platform plugin by searching within the VS Code marketplace and installing it. And of course, since this demonstration is a little bit Apple-like in its uh, presentation, all of this is 100% free and open source. So it's just included as a, uh, as a normal part of our open source development efforts. Now, this plugin has been developed quite rapidly by Rudy Grinberg and team over the last uh, year. It's a fantastic addition to our suite of tools. The LSP server is extremely useful in the repertoire of various other platform tools that we have. And the broader question is, what is our process for accepting, maintaining, and developing such packages? So what I'm going to do next is talk about the Camel platform itself. When it comes to doing a release of the Camel compiler, this is a fairly long and uh, critical process. Each compiler release involves new features, it involves changes to the internals of the compiler, and often bug fixes, and unfortunately, occasionally, regressions to existing functionality. The only way to find these regressions is by running the compiler over large bodies of code. That is the OPAM package repository, which has uh, thousands of OCaml packages released by the community, and trying to detect either build time failures or runtime failures to see if something went wrong. Unfortunately, when we issue a beta release of the compiler, it traditionally doesn't work with a large amount of the ecosystem because the various internal changes in the compiler by definition will make some tools that are deeply tied to the insides of the compiler simply not compatible. This year, and indeed last week, OCaml 4.11 represents the first time that the OCaml development team has released a version of the compiler simultaneously with support for many popular tools. And this was because of a, a very uh, focused joint effort by the OCaml release team with Florian uh, Angela Letty, with Kate Deplay from the OPAM uh, and OPAM repository team, and David also from the OCaml core team, all working together to make sure that they could get a list of OCaml platform tools, and also to modify the OCaml release cycle to add an extra window for these tools to be adapted uh, and for the ecosystem in general uh, to fix any incompatibilities ahead of the full public beta cycle. Now, what were the tools involved in this whole process? Well, it turns out there's quite a few. Um, there's over 16 tools uh, listed here that involve various elements of the ecosystem around OCaml. There is tools to assist with package management. So OCaml Find, which is the traditional uh, package manager for OCaml. For OPAM, the, the source-based package manager, which is used for installation and publishing the Dune build system, uh, the ODOC documentation system for publishing HTML uh, documentation of your APIs, um, all of the editor support required for, for example, for the Visual Studio Code example I showed you earlier on, um, all of the formatting tools inside the, uh, the editor for, uh, for example, OCaml format, and also lots of harnesses for test generation, such as uh, the MDX tool for writing markdown with inline OCaml code. This is a huge diversity of tools a lot of which are used by many, many people and are critical parts of many projects. If we're going to continue maintaining this like this for the, the next few years of OCaml development, this is a lot of effort. And we clearly need a better way to categorize and classify these tools so that we know exactly which ones we need to focus on and also have a process for evolution so that we know 
how we can deprecate tools in the future and also add new tools onto this list. It's clear that the list is big enough now that it's not enough for just one person or uh, any one developer to try to maintain all of these things. It's gonna be a genuine team effort. And so to do this, we've come up with a very simple classification mechanism for how we manage tools within your Camel platform. The first one is the tools which are relatively new. And these are tools that are filling in a gap in the ecosystem. If there is something that simply did not exist before, or if it performs an existing function slightly differently, then we will classify these as incubated tools. And these tools are, by their very nature, being iterated on rapidly. Uh, they might find showstoppers that require them to change their entire approach, or they might simply not work. But whatever happens, if they do work or if they have to uh, eventually just be uh, put to bed, they will almost certainly always have unreliable backwards compatibility. So these are tools that you should not on, depend on too early on in your uh, development lifecycle. But if you have a need for whatever functionality this was, then you should just go ahead and use them. Now, active tools in the Camel platform are the day-to-day the -day projects that you use all the time. So the Dune build system, the Merlin type checking assistant, uh, uh, or the OPAM publish tool in order to get things onto uh, the OPAM uh, uh, source code manager itself. And these have strong backwards compatibility. The idea here is that if we make any changes to active tools, we will also, along with them, publish a well-documented mechanism for developers to move on to the new versions of the tool. And I talked about some of these approaches in last year's talk, for example, using version metadata so that the tool is always aware of what the intentions of the developer were because they've versioned the metadata that they've written inside their source code. And also by having CLI functionality to go backwards and forwards between different versions of your, uh, your, your client ecosystem. So active tools may be adding major features regularly, but they'll not be radically changing their core workflows as incubated tools might be. And then after a while, OCaml is a decades old ecosystem, uh, over 25 years old. And sometimes tools are simply stable. And so for these tools, we call them sustainable tools. And for these, no major new features will be added, but they will be updated for OCaml releases on a best effort. And you could continue to use these often indefinitely, but be aware that there are alternatives which may be better and which may be more actively developed. Now, it's an extremely important part of the ecosystem that these tools exist, and they may be in sustain mode indefinitely. Just because something is not being actively developed does not mean it's no good. It simply means that it served one purpose at this point in time, and that precise purpose is what it will continue for the rest of its existence. It will not see major changes while it's part of the Camel platform. And then for some set of these sustained tools, we know that it's time for them to go because for architectural reasons or for maintenance reasons, they're simply no longer what we want in the platform. And these are often pushed out by the OCaml core development team. And then we propagate that decision through the ecosystem. For deprecated tools, there'll be plenty of notice and there will be recommended alternatives and there'll be some published migration path for projects to migrate. But when a project is in deprecated mode, that's a very strong message. But even though it's a strong message, you will still have a good healthy amount of time to migrate your projects. We're hoping for at least 12 months before any deprecated tool is fully disconnected from the rest of the platform. Now, if we go back to that list of tools I showed you earlier, it should become a little bit easier to figure out how to start categorizing them so that we can manage them in a more holistic way. A number of the tools uh, are incubation tools. You can see from the development velocity of the Camel platform that many, many developers have come up with good ideas. They're filling in gaps in the ecosystem and they're creating these tools for incubation. And then you have the, the regular active set of tools, which should hopefully be quite boring and not come as a surprise. The OPAM source code manager, Dune, Merlin, UTOP, the REPL, and PPXLib for, for handling um, metaprogramming through ASTs. And then in the sustained category, we have tools that have been around for quite a long time. OCaml find the original uh, package manager for OCaml for library compilation units, which still works and is still widely used, is stable and simply updated uh, with the minimum changes required across OCaml versions. OCaml build, which was formerly the recommended build system uh, and included in the OCaml distribution, is still maintained and builds projects as uh, best we can for, uh, for many versions of OCaml. 
And tools such as OCB indent, which is uh, one of the tools used for auto formatting your source code as you type it is also just stable and it works just fine. And then at the bottom, you can start to see the tools which we've taken stronger positions on. The Camel P4 uh, uh, extensible grammar tool, which used to be the preferred way to do metaprogramming uh, around five years ago, has been actively deprecated by the Camel development team. And I'll talk more about what that means and what that impact is uh, for any projects that are still using it. And also the Oasis tool, which was a fantastic tool used for many years to generate build scaffolding using the Camel build has been actively deprecated now as well and not recommended for new projects. So we've seen these tools, we've seen that they're categorized into roughly where they are in the life cycle of development, but what tools are allowed to come into the Camel platform? For example, if I run a JSON parser, can that come in? If I have a web server or a database library that is the best database library ever, can I bring that to the Camel platform and, and have that supported with every Camel release as well? Short answer is no. Initially, um, we're just accepting tools into the Camel platform. And any libraries that depend on those tools, that is tools are defined as binaries that you can install on your system and um, can be invoked from the command line interface. Libraries that these tools use um, will be supported as transitive dependencies. Now, obviously, if you look at that big list that um, I had in the previous slide, the number of libraries supporting these tools is huge. And each tool takes a decision about which set of libraries it uses. Those libraries are not supported as first class citizens in the Camel ecosystem, but they will be supported for as long as the tools are using them. And if a tool migrates away to a different library, then um, any uh, guarantees about uh, those, the use of those former libraries is no longer part of the Camel platform scope. And then if you do have a tool, we've designed certain principles by which we can decide whether or not that tool gets into the platform. Firstly, we're going to ask, does this tool support sharing? Does it assist with the reuse and publication of a Camel code? That is one of the fundamental reasons the Camel platform exists, to create a wider body of a Camel code in an uh, ecosystem so that we can reuse it and be more efficient with our development. Secondly, does it empower an Camel developer to be more efficient? And the definition of a Camel developer is broad. If it helps onboarding of, of a new developer, if it helps maintain a legacy code base that's really, really old, um, if it does anything in between, then it's part of the uh, development uh, scope for the Camel platform. And then things that go into the Camel platform often have to survive for years. And so we're gonna ask, is there a strategy for how we can incrementally evolve and update and maintain this tool and also provide backwards compatibility to our users? Uh, almost without exception, a tool that gets in to the Ocamel ecosystem ends up being used for quite a long time. Source code just never really goes away. It just, it just retires very, very slowly over the course of many, many years. And so by building in first-class support for evolution, we wanna make sure that these tools are as equipped as possible to minimize the maintainer burden after the years take on. And finally, we have to make sure that we retain openness in our ecosystem. So we have to make sure that the, the, the various systems are liberally licensed in their open source code, and also to make sure that there are no operational restrictions in the use of those codes. So for example, if you depend on a online service that is only accessible uh, through this tool, then that would be a problem for the platform. Ideally, everything should be run locally and then also self-hosted online, but not strongly depend on those online services. You'll notice that there are exceptions to this. GitHub is one that comes up all the time. And so we're not 100% there when it comes to uh, enforcing these principles, but they provide guidelines for our broad evolution. And then finally, we have structural requirements. And we just wanna make sure that there's a good set of maintainers for these, these tools, that they, they've established a need in the community for them. It's not some hyper obscure use of a camel and they demonstrate some adoption. There's no hard rules on how much adoption you need, but there's gotta be more than just a few projects using this in order to uh, make it a worthwhile project for uh, joining as an active project in the Camel platform. So let's consider the life cycle of this platform now. I've talked about how we can have incubated projects, we can move into um, active mode where they're developed, then sustained projects, which uh, slow down a little bit as they enter uh, late middle age, and then deprecated projects, which um, get a retirement after a good uh, a number of years working for the community. 
The first one to consider is our, our, our active projects. These are cornerstone projects in the ecosystem that are heavily depended on by many, many tools. For those unfamiliar with some of these, OPAM is a source fit package management tool. Uh, Dune is a composable build system for OCaml. Uh, Merlin is the IDE and type checker integration that is used by uh, almost uh, every single IDE integration. UTOP is an interactive REPL often used for teaching. Uh, PPXLib is a library that operates behind the scenes, but is used to build binaries for uh, code generation. So the PPX drivers that operate as one of the build phases when we, when we actually generate uh, uh, code from our uh, annotations in OCaml. And OPAM Publish is widely used to submit any project using OPAM into uh, the OPAM repository ecosystem. So the usage guidelines for active projects are simply that they're the recommendation for newcomers who are just starting a new project. For these, we just want to have a strong guidance for newcomers that, yes, there is a lot of choice in the OCaml ecosystem, but if you use these, you're in a safe path that will be maintained for a certain amount of time. Critically, Although we give this guidance to newcomers, we do not force the use of these tools on anyone using OCaml. Advanced users can continue to use the tool chain directly. There's many, many cases why you, uh, these tools don't quite have 100% fit for what you need. And for example, in my own uh, project, the Mirage OS Unicurl project, we often need to do very low level compilation with uh, custom rules for compiling to embedded targets. In that case, Mirage OS is free to bypass the platform and to invoke the compiler itself. But of course, when it does this, it's bypassing a lot of the support uh, guarantees that we make for the platform, and Mirage may need to do some extra work whenever an OCaml uh, release is, uh, is, um, is, is put out there. If you're just using these recommended active tools, then we're hopefully minimizing the amount of work you have to do to maintain your code if you don't want to pay close attention to the OCaml ecosystem. And so obviously a critical part of being an active project is that we avoid a duplication of functionality, that we don't want to have multiple tools doing exactly the same thing that are simultaneously maintained. In this case, the answer is simple. The maintainers will talk to each other and they will fix the problems and they will try to minimize any duplication that is, is going on that will confuse new users and also in, increase the maintenance burden for our camel code. And finally, we want to make sure that any metadata files that are added to source code are version reliably using, this, uh, using active projects. This is something that is a deceptively large amount of work. Both OPAM and Dune have versioned uh, file formats, and they support the interpretation of very old versions of those file formats. So for example, OPAM, if you give it an OPAM 1 version file, will transparently upgrade and migrate this to version 2. Dune will also do similar things with any Dune files that you provided. If you have a Dune file uh, that is written as supporting Dune 1.3, if you use the latest Dune clients 2.7.0, it will pretend to be Dune 1.3 when interpreting and executing those rules. So this has been a lot of work, but it means that we can just seamlessly update the client versions and projects can decide when they want to update their own metadata to the latest versions of these active tools. Now, moving on from the active tools, we have our incubated tools. And the idea here is that they fill a gap in the ecosystem. Uh, if we wanted to build a cross-reference documentation in the past, OCaml doc, which is the default documentation tool built with the, uh, built with the compiler, simply doesn't support it. And so ODoc is a tool that was incubated to solve this particular problem. Until a couple of years ago, OCaml format didn't exist. And there was no way to take a larger OCaml code base and to do mechanical code formatting. Everyone has their own style and their own mechanism of doing this. So Camel format is proposed in order to have one way to bring big projects together. It's obviously very ambitious. Syntax is one of the most uh, bike shedded topics and one of the most controversial topics of uh, development. And Camel format has a myriad of options and a very large uh, challenge ahead of it. But it's, it's solving it, it's gradually getting adoption and it's being steadily released and getting better and better and better. So it's a perfect project for incubation. LSP server is the one I just described where we have a new uh, single binary for uh, IDE backends and it's, uh, there wasn't one before and it integrates everything uh, such as Merlin and uh, ODoc and OMD into one binary for use in Visual Studio Code. And similarly, MDX, Bun and Dune release provide very narrow bits of functionality that just did not exist before. MDX helps you just write markdown files with documentation, execute them from the top level, 
uh, Bun provides a simple way to do automated fuzz testing from within CI systems. And Dune release is an easier way to release projects into OPAM if you're using the Dune build system. OPAM publish, which is active, uh, requires you to use um, uh, OPAM. Dune release requires you to use both OPAM and Dune. So it's a more specialized tool than the other ones. Now, how do these tools get migrated into the bigger world? Well, firstly, oh, we, we just have to establish a migration path and a need for those tools and ensure that there's no duplication among other active tools. If there is duplication, it doesn't mean that this tool cannot get in. It simply means that maintainers have to have a conversation and resolve uh, the duplication in, in an agreeable way. So ODOC, for example, is aiming to replace all major uses of a camel dock and then proposing itself as a replacement for a camel dock in the OCaml 4.13 release cycle. So that is two release cycles from now. Um, OCaml format wants to subsume the functionality of as you type indentation, which means that it will include all of the features that OCP indent has as well as new features, and then it's suitable for promotion to the next level. LSP server simply needs a little bit of time. The stable release, the first one got released last week. So it just needs a release cycle for us to get familiar with uh, how to support it and how to use it. And then we can make stronger guarantees about its um, long-term support status once we get a bit more experience with user feedback and large code bases and so on. So time is an important part of uh, the life cycle as well. And then Dune release is a great example where there's duplication. It does kind of the same similar thing as OPAM Publish but with the alternative user interface. And so in this case, both of the maintainers will just talk to each other and we'll figure out how to merge these things. For example, Dune release will just become an option in OPAM Publish and uh, we will not require multiple code bases there as well. Now, when it comes to sustained projects, some of these have been around for years and they will continue to be around for years. Uh, they're all maintained on a best effort basis, uh, but because they're so stable, they require relatively little work and we, we're fairly familiar with uh, their code bases. So Camel Find, for example, is a compilation manager, or Camel Build um, is the venerable build system, and OSB Indent is the um, as you type code formatting. In this case, it's important to say that a sustained project will be around. Uh, if you're using them, you have, if you have a big project, then just continue to use them, but be aware that there are better alternatives. So a camel find you don't need to use directly these days because it's wrapped by, uh, for example, the Dune build system and uh, OPAM also can uh, um, understand uh, certain aspects of metafiles. Or camel build, we recommend you migrate to Dune, but we recognize that there's some very large code bases using a camel build today. So you might not be able to take advantage of new camel options, but if you do happen to need them, then patches are welcome. But try to move towards uh, the, the new active build system over the course of the next few years. And hopefully you'll see significant benefits from doing so as well. It's not just uh, migrating for the sake of it. There's all the performance benefits and the backwards compatibility benefits that Doom brings. And similarly, OCB indent works just fine if you're using it right now, but it's being steadily supplanted by OCaml format. And then on to deprecated projects. Um, Calm P4, for example, is uh, uh, an extensible grammar system that uh, was part of the core OCaml compiler until it got removed. And it's a good example of what a deprecated project means. Deprecated projects are only deprecated for the OCaml platform. It doesn't mean that we're deleting the repos and they're just going to disappear. All it means is that we're simply stopping the guarantee that they will be released in sync with the compiler. However, any community user is welcome to step up and to take over maintainership. So for example, in Camel B4, YGREC has taken over maintainership of it. I believe it was used in the ML Donkey peer-to-peer -peer file uh, transfer system. And so that project requires Camel B4. It's still available in, in OPAM. It can still be a dependency uh, in uh, maintenance releases of, um, of uh, ML Donkey, but it's simply not something that we will take a dependency on when we build new tools. What you might be seeing here is that over the last 20 years or so, we have to strike a balance between progress and stability. So here's a thought experiment. If we'd released the OCaml platform in 2013, and we'd had a hard requirement that you're meant to use the build system supplied with OCaml, that is OCaml build, would the Dune projects exist today? It's likely we would have muddled on with OCaml build, we would have tried to extend it, but the core architecture of OCaml build would probably not have shifted to the Dune model, which is go away from writing OCaml code for your build rules and try to write down interpretable and version metadata files instead. 
And so we, we want to make sure that there is room for new projects to show up that can innovate. And we also have to make sure that they get mature enough before they replace active ones, we don't disrupt large parts of our ecosystem that are depending on those active tools. And this new model, we hope, will strike that balance. New projects can be proposed for incubation. They simply have to motivate why they're different from previous projects or what their goals are and why they're different uh, from something that already exists. Even if that's a small delta, that's totally fine. And we will figure out um, how to uh, weave that into the overall platform. But we will not be replacing active projects that are widely used before we have a good story for how, project, uh, how uh, projects can migrate and also giving plenty of time for moving between different parts of these, uh, these, uh, these life cycles. So for example, an active project will never be deprecated directly. We'll move it into sustained mode. We will guarantee a couple of release cycles at least where we will try to maintain it uh, against releases of Camel and give plenty of notice for people to move, move on. One of the most important things is that maintainer guidelines mean that any active project has to remain open to contributors. That is, we wanna make sure that these projects are not closed to a particular employer, a particular geography, or anything else. If someone wants to contribute to an active Camel project, then of course, with the assent of the maintainers and after contributing PRs, they should be able to join in. Again, we have to strike a balance between open and closed development. The maintainers of tools have to take lots and lots of decisions uh, we have to look at hundreds and hundreds of PRs and lots of conflicting opinions and just take a decision sometimes. So our dev meetings are not directly open, but they're all handled through uh, online video calls, through, uh, we have a Jitsi server, for example, that uh, can be used for uh, video conferencing. But we're practical. We, we've been encouraging the maintainers to put all the development minutes online. So you can see URLs for OPAM, for Dune, for ODOC, so that you can just go there, you can browse through the minutes, you can see what the maintainers are thinking, and then directly contact them using the issue tracker or any other discussion forums, uh, or indeed directly just have a conversation about what you want to do as well. So with this, we think we, we, we strike a balance between just getting a fire hose of too much feedback for the maintainers and making sure that new developers can come in and get involved if they want to as well. Who are these maintainers? As you can see, we have a large number of people. These are the chief maintainers for these, uh, for these projects. And behind them, we also have many, many contributors that are, uh, that are sending in major feature requests. And a back of the envelope calculation for these projects showed that we have over 200 contributors for just for these core tools alone. So um, maintenance of these tools is a significant effort. And although we're a small community, I would really like to thank just how much effort all of these maintainers have put in uh, for maintaining these platform tools. And these maintainers work for a diverse range of organizations from from Tarides, Jane Street, or Camel Pro, or Camel Labs, Inria, Facebook, the Camel Software Foundations, or often there are individual contributors who are spending their spare time working on these projects. So um, you can use this as a reference for who to contact, but also perhaps send a thank you message to them just to say that you appreciate their work um, and um, to give them a little bit of positive feedback as well. It's always welcome and very rare. Now, this incubation model is also useful for one other thing, for cataloging all of the services we run on ocaml.org. When running an online service like ocaml.org, it, it started off fairly small, but we see a lot of traffic these days and often big surges and spikes of traffic thanks to getting on random social media with, with whatever hot topic of the day is going on. Uh, and so it's been useful to categorize these services and also to give a little bit of notice before there's any major change. So for Camel.org, we have a number of active projects. We have the CI system, we have the discussion forums, we have virtual machines running Discord bots, we have the main website, of course, and uh, email services. We're gonna see some deprecation of these services over the next 12 months. In particular, the email service um, has not been heavily used since we launched the discussion forum, and it's a big maintenance burden, just because of the vast amount of spam flying around the internet these days, and generally blocking of these things. So it's likely that I'll move it into a maintenance mode where uh, we're already not really accepting new email lists. We haven't really had any requests for a while. Um, and then make it an archive only system because there's very little traffic flowing through those as well. And the Forge, which was a code sharing tool uh, that Silver Lagan uh, used to run before uh, GitHub and GitLab took over, will finally have his DNS entries removed as there's been many years of notice before we can, uh, we can deprecate that. Of course, it's not all bad news. Uh, there's been a lot of work into improving and creating new services as well. 
ci.recover.org, which is the continuous integration system that you see every time you submit a package to OCurrent repository, um, has been improved with one based on a new CI called OCurrent. And OCurrent is a workflow language that Thomas Leonard has developed along with um, a host of help from a number of other contributors. And he'll be talking about that in the next session uh, uh, about a zero configuration CI. And also docs.camel.org, which represents a centralized aggregation of all of the OPAM packages is seeing major improvements and advances uh, this year as well. And John Ludlam, who's now the chief maintainer of ODOC, has a talk in this session where he will discuss the detailed uh, uh, improvements in ODOC and also the path to getting to this new website. And so both these, um, these, these new systems, the docs.camel.org and a private Git sharing system to uh, provide a hedge against GitHub going down are new incubation projects in the OCaml.org infrastructure. And um, the only deprecated one, which is being strongly deprecated, is Forge of .org. I'd like to this point give a really warm thank you to the sponsors who have given us a lot of infrastructure to drive these services. So we do hundreds of thousands of builds of uh, packages on uh, this infrastructure every month, millions uh, every year. This is because we do bulk builds and multiple architectures. Uh, we check for regressions in the compiler and every single package submitted is also run through checks on about 14 Linux distributions. So Packet has, has contributed uh, some big machines to us. Scaleway has contributed a number of x86 machines. Amazon has given us access to one of their, uh, their, um, their new uh, ARM machines and Cambridge University is paying for power and hosting for um, around 20 kind of major machines. So. Ocamador would not be possible without these and uh, the contribution of the various maintainers who help who help uh, keep the services running. So thank you. So what are the next steps to the Ocamador platform? I'm going to talk about that next. The first step will be to transcribe and to document this process I've described onto the Ocamador website itself. And as part of that process, we are going to merge the opam.ocamador.org site with the main Ocamador website. When we first developed Opam, we weren't sure whether or not it was going to become the de facto standard for OCaml. Obviously, it takes just time to decide if that uh, is going to succeed or not. Over time, it has succeeded. We have uh, thousands of packages uh, submitted to the OPAM repository, and it is now the recommended way by which people should consume OCaml packages. So having that as a separate website just doesn't make any sense anymore. It's confusing for newcomers, and it provides a duplication of content that is just difficult to maintain. So we'll be merging that with the OCaml site and, uh, and providing redirects and backwards compatible links for all of the existing content. The second bit of feedback that we consistently get about OCaml is that it's hard to keep up at a high level if you're not a close part of the community about what is going on. And so we wanna add a newsfeed to the OCaml site for active tool announcements and also for any announcements about migrations between statuses. If a incubated tool is promoted to active or more worryingly for uh, users who prefer stability, if something is deprecated or moved into sustain mode, we will have a dedicated place on the Hamel site for you to just read this without all of the other discussion going on on the forums. Now for the purposes of integration, it's actually quite convenient to simply use discuss.hamel.org as a summary mechanism for the website. So we'll likely use a tag or other filtering mechanisms to post these bits of content on the discussion websites and then simply have them mirrored onto the more static OCaml website. So we can continue to let users who navigate to OCaml.org ask questions using our forums, but to uh, see a more filtered view of the content. One of the uh, nicer bits of feedback I got this year was that the multi-core monthlies that uh, we've been uh, publishing from OCaml Labs and IIT Madras have been really, really popular because they provide just a high level view for people not tracking multicore directly. So I'm gonna somehow take the time to, uh, to, to uh, do the same thing for the platform itself and to make sure that you can all get a monthly summary or perhaps a quarterly summary if monthly is too often about all of the changes and tools and, and what's been going on. Finally, we wanna make sure that we add workflow guides about all of these recommended tools directly to OCaml.org. So instead of having them on blogs and, and lots of distributed sources, now that we have a framework by which we can decide what our active tools are and our incubation tools are and, and so on, we can sensibly add these to OCaml.org and we can get the maintainers of the various tools to bless them and to make sure that we also reflect 
um, all of the various layers of these tools. So advanced users will know how to bypass them and newcomers will know how to use them directly. Uh, and so we can do this in a, in a more unified way across there. Both uh, the Ocaml Software Foundation through uh, John Whittington, I believe, and uh, Teradez through uh, Patrick Ferris are working on various proposals for different aspects of Ocaml.org. So if you're interested, interested in this, go to the Ocaml.org uh, issue tracker on GitHub under Ocaml slash Ocaml.org on GitHub and simply look at the issue tracker and we'll label the various issues appropriately so that you can find these bits of discussion as well. So I've covered just a huge amount of development and, and, and introduced you to lots and lots of tools that have happened in the last 12 months, but we're not finished yet. So although we've got this framework for the tools, we've done synchronous releases with the Camel platform, there's still some major, major missing development gaps. The first one is simply the lack of Windows support. Whenever it comes to installing a Camel for a new user, a system like Visual Studio Code is fantastic because you suddenly don't have to worry about all of the individual installation of the tools because the Visual Studio Code plugin takes care of that for you. But the consistent blocker for anyone developing installers is that our Windows support simply isn't there yet. So what I'm going to talk about next and to wrap up this talk is to cover our high level development plans for, uh, for OPAM and the, the various tools over the next 12 months. The first thing to do, of course, is to just have a quick recap about the OCaml community. How are we doing in terms of metrics to the OPAM repository? The answer is uh, we're up and to the right as, 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 as usual, as has happened over the last um, eight years when I've given this talk. Uh, you can see that this is the total number of OPAM packages submitted to the OPAM repository. And in the last year, we've actually seen an increased velocity of submissions. And this is partly due to both uh, Jane Street, to Tezos, uh, and to various other communities just submitting their packages uh, much more quickly to the OPAM repository as we make it easier to submit packages. This is the total number of unique OPAM packages. So the previous graph showed you the total number including all versions. This shows you the total number of unique packages. The spike there, um, the two spikes you see in the, in, in the last year were Jane Street releasing a new uh, major release of the, the core libraries and Tezos for the first time releasing their uh, blockchain system onto this platform. And then the good news is that the total number of contributors is also going up. So we've just broken a thousand unique contributors or packages uh, to, the, to the repository and it's great to see uh, just more people uh, joining and, and sending uh, packages. So it's not just the same people doing it, but it's them and new contributors coming into uh, to our world as well. When it comes to releases of tools, over the last few years, we've been really, really uh, busy with the migration to OPAM2 and to make sure that the new workflows in OPAM2 are working for our users. So in 2017, we had several OPAM betas uh, to make sure that we could test things out. Uh, in, in 2018, we, we did the migration from OPAM1 to OPAM2, released the OPAM stable, and we converted the OPAM repo to the new format. Uh, in 2019, we spent a lot of time just releasing a steady set of bug fixes from the OPAM 2.0 series. Uh, Raja Bushbull uh, took over as a fantastic maintainer for OPAM, as anyone who interacts with the repository will, uh, will confirm. And together with Louis Gespert and David Olsop, uh, we're working hard on making sure that these point releases were just, just refining and polishing that OPAM2 experience. Now, uh, the exciting news is that after uh, about 18 months of development on the master branch, we also have an OPAM2.1 beta as well that is released as of this week and as of the OCaml workshop. The OPAM2.1 beta is a big release. It includes hundreds of bug fixes. So many, many of the bug reports that uh, you would have sent over the last cycle were too big to fix in the OPAM2 cycle, and they've been fixed in OPAM2.1 and they include some major features. The first one is that we have integrated external dependency handling. One of the coolest features of OPAM is that it not only in, in installs a camel source code, but it also encodes the external dependencies from your operating system package manager. So if you're on Debian, it knows how to in invoke apt. If you're on Homebrew, it knows how to, uh, on macOS, sorry, it knows how to invoke Homebrew or Mac ports, uh, on OpenSUSE, on FreeBSD and OpenBSD and so forth. But before that was implemented as an external plugin. And that made it awkward to use from CI and so on. So now when you install OPAM 2.1, it can not only just install them seamlessly with prompts uh, to make sure that you're okay with installing stuff from your package manager, 
It can also mark packages as unavailable if they're simply not available on your operating system. So this means the solver can pick another uh, version of the package which is compatible with uh, your source code. So this will reduce the amount of breakage that you see when you use um, um, OPAM packages and upgrades. Second big feature is OPAM lock integration. This generates a fixed version file via OPAM lock, which ensures that any further updates to the OPAM repository don't, no longer apply. You'll get exactly the same versions of the code that you used when you compile the local switch. And this helps with building reproducible switches from these lock files. And the cool thing about OPAM lock integration is that any tool can generate these OPAM lock files. Although OPAM lock has a built-in version for you to use, these are just normal OPAM files. And so any other tool can come along and I'll talk about some tools that are doing the same thing um, later on in this talk. Because OPAM is heavily used in CI systems and in automated workflows, it's also difficult to evolve uh, the CLI without breaking existing workflows. So instead of forcing you all to detect OPAM 2.1 versus OPAM 2.0, in scripts, you can now just simply set uh, an environment variable or you can add a CLI flag to guarantee the 2.1 behavior. So whenever OPAM 2.2 comes out, if you set this flag, it will guarantee that 2.1 is, uh, is, 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 is the mechanism used. And between 2.1 and 2.0, there's been very limited sets of CLI changes. So we've been working hard to make sure this is as seamless a transition as possible. And then when it comes to using the OCaml compiler, we have a notion of switch invariance now. So when you construct a switch, you can give it a much richer constraint language in order to specify which version of OCaml you want. And this means that if there's, for example, a minor patch release of OCaml, it can automatically update your switch and recompile to the new patch version without you having to construct a new switch. And then Behind the scenes, there's lots and lots and lots of performance improvements. So faster repository loading, uh, just more optimized uh, access to the, the system in many cases. We interleave downloading and installation. When OPAM2 came out, we had an average of, uh, I think it was about 30 or 40 packages per installation. And now we see packages uh, that use hundreds of dependencies. So by downloading them and installing them at the same time, you can just significantly improve speed. Uh, we also have more efficient uh, implementation of file copying so that uh, package installation is simply better than before. And we also have new solver strategies to cope with the growth of the size of the OPAM repository. And so one in particular, the new OPAM zero install solver is optimized for finding from scratch solutions. So if you're simply trying to install a package and uh, you've been seeing solver timeouts in 2.0, these will disappear with the new solver in, uh, in 2.1. But of course, the old solver was optimized for uh, upgrades and, and fresh versions, and that still exists for those nice small adjustments as you're uh, developing OPAM code. We're also incubating new plugins to support new workflows. So if you saw my talk from last year, last year I focused on trying to understand what all of the different workflows that industrial users and casual users of, uh, of OCaml had. And it turns out that there's quite a big matrix and it's hard to figure out how to innovate uh, in these new workflows without disrupting existing users who are trying to just keep in with what they're doing. And so we are doing this via a plugin mechanism in OPAM, which has always existed, but has been a little bit underused. With OPAM 2.1, we're releasing three new plugins, which extend the OPAM CLI uh, with new commands. And these provide experimental access to new workflows. And because these are plugins that are independent release for OPAM, we can update these plugins and we can, uh, we can, we can uh, iterate on them much more rapidly simply by releasing to the OPAM repository. And we can get user feedback on them and we can figure out uh, in a future release cycle of OPAM whether or not they're appropriate uh, to integrate into the mainline OPAM. One of them is uh, an OPAM compiler plugin, uh, which manages OCaml compiler installations much more easily. So because it knows where the OCaml compiler is hosted, it knows uh, about the existence of PRs, for example, you, you, you can give it a much shorter CLI to try out an experimental uh, pull, pull request uh, in, 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 um, uh, in the core OCaml development. One of, the, uh, one of the consequences of the OPAM2 approach to package management is that it turned the OCaml compiler into a package as well. And this brought a host of benefits, but it also made it a little bit harder to use it for day-to-day -day development. And the OPAM compiler tries to let you do in-place updates of the compiler so you can make a change to the compiler and not have to reinstall the whole thing in order to um, test your changes out. OPAM Tools is a new plugin, which simply detects the OPAM metadata and it constructs a local switch that is a switch that is in the current directory of the project and is completely sandboxed from the rest of OPAM. 
and it will copy in all of the platform binaries into the uh, into the binary directory of uh, this uh, this project. This means that you can simply type in OPAM tools and it will bootstrap Merlin and LSP and Dune and or Camel format all to the right versions as needed for that project. Uh, this also does not introduce any new dependencies in the switch. It simply builds the tools in a different switch and copies the binaries over. So this means that no conflicts from uh, the tools will exist in your local project. So it's a real uh, time saver and it's used by, for example, the Visual Studio Code plugin to do bootstrap of projects behind the scenes as well. And OPAM Monorepo represents um, the more extreme workflow I described last year about switching away from using individual packages installed through OPAM uh, to using a large monorepo where everything is compiled using Dune. This is not something for the casual user. This is a workflow that tends to be used by very big projects and projects with specialized requirements. So Jane Street, for example, uh, have a large monorepo. Uh, the Cog project uh, have now adopted uh, Dune. So they have a huge monorepo, which can be used for, um, uh, uh, for development of uh, large numbers of proofs. And the Mirage OS project is also switching to using monorepos as well. But monorepos require a very different discipline. And so the OPAM monorepo plugin, which is formerly known as Duneverse, which I presented last year, is now integrated with OPAM and is provided as an alternative workflow. It's still nowhere near as seamless as the original OPAM workflow is and will require a lot of iteration before it gets there. But this provides an easy way for users to try it and give us feedback and to let more projects adopt it before we can see um, how it operates um, in the wild. So these are all under development. And we'd also like to encourage anyone else who has ideas for workflows to come along and develop new plugins and join the OPAM developer meetings as well. So just get in touch with me or uh, any of the OPAM developers from uh, Roger Bujbul to Louis Gesper to Thomas Casanier or David Alsop, and we'll talk to you about how to build a, a plugin as well. Which leads us on to OPAM 2.2. OPAM 2.1 is already in beta and it represents 18 months of hard work, but we're looking to the future. And what we want to do is to focus OPAM 2.2 very firmly on the Windows release. Historically, Windows support has been patchy, you know, Camel. It's been superbly supported in the compiler, um, often uh, maintained by David Alsop and, and Zeve Lois, but the surrounding ecosystem has not coalesced in the same way that it has for Linux and for Mac OS. And so as soon as OPAM 2.1.0 is released, all of the OPAM uh, maintainers and indeed several other maintainers of other tools, uh, Rudy Grinberg has, has agreed to give Windows a try uh, and several Dune developers have as well, uh, apart from that. And we've decided we're all gonna start switching to Windows and focus together on getting end-to-end -end Windows support into these tools. This will integrate FD Open's superb uh, Sigma and Fork, but also integrate um, the big, big matrix of uh, different combinations of tooling that Windows supports and also try to figure out what to do about the rapid advances in WSL and WSL2 and the new world that, uh, that Windows is promoting. The interesting thing is that we thought that this would involve just doing nothing but um, adding Windows compatibility code to OPAM. But when we did the work and we specified what it would take, it turns out that it only requires a certain set of key features which would also help other platforms. And these include the native shell integration, uh, so we don't assume the existence of a Unix environment, of the idea of package parameters so that we can track uh, variables uh, through OPAM files that control how the build works. And this also helps rationalize the hundreds and hundreds of compiler variants that we have in uh, the OPAM repository for the OCaml compiler as well. So this helps with the uh, Windows matrix, but it will also just reduce the number of choices that we have on, on, on Mac OS and Linux as well. And layered switches is the generalization of the OPAM tools plugin where we can build binaries in one switch and then simply export just those binaries, nothing else, across switches. So this will isolate and sandbox multiple conflicting dependencies across OPAM installations. And the last one is expanding one of the most advanced features of OPAM, which is that for a source code manager, we've always had support for uh, sandboxing, using operating system sandboxing, such as Linux uh, namespaces uh, for using bubble wrap or uh, the Mac OS app sandbox mechanism. And this means that any source code build trying to write outside the sandbox will be prevented by the operating system. And we can generalize this to add Windows support as well. 
Uh, but it also unlocks the intriguing possibility that we can use this to build directly within containers as well. So we could define a build environment as a Docker client and a container, and we could then use this as a very, very uh, cheap and cheerful way of, of cross-compiling across many, many targets. So there's more details about the quote-unquote Windows release, uh, which is in fact just adding a bunch of features uh, to unlock Windows on the OPAM wiki as well. And you can see a whole bunch of specifications and plans that we have um, on the OPAM website as well, um, on the same wiki. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention and stay safe and healthy out there. I look forward to discussing this with you online on the discussion forums and on the ICFB uh, video chat as well. Bye-bye.